Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. The murder of an entire family is an incredible tragedy. But when no apparent motive exists and the case remains unsolved, it's a double tragedy. Today's episode is about a case that is 55 years old with no arrests made and very few clues to go on. These murders are plagued with more questions than answers. Okay, on to the show. August 1965 marked another interesting chapter in the history of the United States. In New York, the Beatles had just landed for a North American tour, creating massive crowds of screaming fans. In Los Angeles, the Watts riots started on August 11th. The riots started when a black man, Marquette Fry, was stopped by a California Highway Patrol motorcycle officer, allegedly for driving recklessly. Marquette was given a field sobriety test and placed under arrest. His brother Ronald, who had been a passenger in the vehicle, walked to their house nearby and brought back their mother, Rena Price. Rena started chastising Marquette for driving drunk, but somehow things escalated and Rena was pushed. Marquette was struck. Rena jumped on an officer and a shotgun was pulled. Additional officers attempted to arrest Marquette using force and a large crowd formed. Word quickly spread that the officers had kicked a pregnant woman, and the crowd began throwing things at the police. Marquette, Ronald, and Rena were all eventually arrested, but the problem would only escalate. Riots began overnight. Community leaders held a meeting the next day to calm the situation, but nothing helped. The city felt compelled to bring in the California National Guard, but the riots would last for six days and result in 34 deaths. There were over a 1,000 injuries, approximately 3,500 arrests, and $40 million in property damage. Residents of L.A. who could left the city for the weekend. Understandably, families in California were glued to their televisions, watching the riots. The same was true for Hester Bowles, but by August 16th, she was tired of watching the news coverage and was growing concerned about her own son, James, and his family who had gone to their new cabin in Crestline over the weekend. They were supposed to have returned the night before, but she had not heard from them. She felt uneasy and finally called the Hughes Aircraft Plant in El Segundo, where James and his wife Darlene both worked. James was an engineer at the plant, and Darlene worked in a different sector. The couple had not made it into work yet, so Hester called Rena Rice, Darlene's mother, to see if she had heard from them. Rena had not talked to Darlene since before the Bulls left the city to go to their new cabin. Darlene and her mother had gone shopping for last-minute purchases to take to Crestline. Rena said it was unusual for Darlene not to call, especially since it was their first weekend in the cabin. After the two mothers hung up, Rena called her son Floyd Rice and expressed their concerns to him. He said he thought there was nothing to worry about and was sure everything was fine. After he hung up from talking with his mother, he called Hester and reassured her as well. He let both women know he'd look into it and get back with them. Unfortunately, Floyd had only been to the area where the cabin was one time, a decade earlier, when Jim and Darlene actually purchased the property. Construction had started earlier in the year, and since this was the first weekend it had been habitable, he had not been to the completed cabin yet. Jim had borrowed a truck the weekend before to take items to the cabin, but Floyd had not gone with him. Floyd decided to call the contractor who had built the cabin and ask if someone in the office could go by, since the Bulls did not have a phone at the cabin yet. Around 10.30 a.m., Bob George said he would go by the cabin, but Floyd never heard back from him. Floyd called the contractor's office again, but the receptionist was the only one in and had not heard anything. Floyd then contacted the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department to ask if they could make contact with the cabin. The Sheriff's Department said yes, but they would have to contact the Crestline substation, which could take a while, due to the limited number of personnel available. By this time, Floyd had become extremely frustrated with the lack of information about his family. 
One of his employees, John Wilcoxon, suggested they go to the cabin and check things out themselves. Floyd said he did not know where the cabin was, but John said they could get directions once they got to Crestline. They arrived in Crestline around 4.15 p.m. and stopped at several places for directions. They finally arrived at the cabin at around 5 p.m. The new cabin was small with a great room, two bedrooms and a bath, and had been painted green. Floyd did not see either of the family vehicles, a red Dodge or a white Mercury Comet. The cabin had a small paved driveway, which Floyd parked on. Then the two men walked up the dirt drive to the large porch that ran along the entire front of the cabin. They looked inside the window and saw the family dachshund, Barbara, on the couch, covered in blood. Shocked, Floyd went to the front door and found it unlocked. John suggested they leave and go to the sheriff's substation, but Floyd wanted to go ahead and go inside. He was nervous as he entered the cabin and saw no one in the great room. He walked towards the bedroom, but before he made it, he could see bodies through the open doorway. Horrified, he recognized his brother-in-law, Jim, his sister, Darlene, and one of the boys, presumably Bobby, the 13-year-old. Jim was on the floor in front of the closet where the sliding door had been completely knocked off its tracks. Darlene was in the closet, and although he wasn't seen at first, she was lying on top of the younger son, Tommy. Floyd ran back to John and said, They're in there. They're all dead. The two men raced to the Crestline substation, arriving there around 5.10 p.m. Sergeant Warner, the duty officer, called headquarters and spoke to Sergeant Patterson homicide detail. He asked Patterson to have Detectives Charles Callahan and Charles Rex stand by. Sergeant Warner then notified all units by radio to be on the lookout for the two vehicles registered to the Bulls. After doing all of this, he went to the Bulls' cabin around 5.30 p.m. Floyd and John went with him. Once they arrived at the cabin, Warner verified what Floyd had described to him and the trio of men returned to the substation after Warner directed a deputy to guard the crime scene. Once back at the substation, Warner contacted Homicide again and asked for the three detectives to come assist. They arrived at the substation around 6.40 p.m. and Wagner told the detectives all he knew and had found. The men, including Floyd and John, went to the cabin. When they approached the cabin, they did so through the blanket of pine needles surrounding the structure so they would not disturb any footprints. The detectives looked through the window and saw the dog on the couch and several spent twenty-two cartridge shells. There was a pair of house shoes and tennis shoes in the middle of the great room floor. Photographs were taken of the living room before any other officers entered the cabin. Once the pictures were taken, Sergeant Patterson and Detective Callahan entered the cabin. Detective Rack left to try to contact neighbors. They noted blood spatter all over the living room area, across the fireplace, the coffee table, and the dinette set in the kitchen, on the way to the bedroom where Floyd had seen his sister and her family. Jim was in a prone position on his back, with his son Bobby slouched against the wall behind him. Darlene was in the closet in a crouched position, apparently trying to shield Tommy. The victims were fully clothed. There were 35 shell casings found throughout the cabin. 30 of these were found in the bedroom with the victims. No weapon was discovered. It appeared that a knife had been wiped off on the foot of the bedspread based on the blood smears. There were several footprints close to Jim's feet. It was a ridge sole measuring about 11 inches. There was no sign of forced entry into the cabin nor into the bedroom. Jim's wallet was found on an end table in the living room with no cash but several real estate receipts, a few credit cards, and a checked bag ticket from Langham Hotel in Johannesburg, South Africa. A check stub was found for $134.44 along with a deposit slip. The deposit slip dated the previous Friday, indicated $74.44 had been returned in cash, although this money was not found in the cabin. The bodies were photographed at the morgue, focusing on the injuries. James had sustained injuries to his lower right leg and his left knee, as well as multiple injuries in the chest and head. Darlene had injuries to the right side of her face, right ear, and shoulder, 
as well as multiple injuries to her arms and chest. Bobby sustained multiple injuries to the back of his neck and head, as well as to his upper body. Tommy had multiple to the top of his head, chest, and arms. Investigators returned to the cabin at daylight the next day and found a spent 22 slug on the couch, as well as bullet holes on the couch and in throw pillows. They checked outside the cabin, but did not find anything of note. It had rained on Sunday afternoon, so trace evidence would likely have been washed away. The San Bernardino County Chief Deputy Coroner, A.J. McCann, said it appeared the family had been herded into the bedroom where they were shot. The deaths occurred sometime between Saturday night and Monday, but no definitive time was given initially. The family was shot 42 times. Jim, 43, was hit 15 times. Darlene, 37, was hit 14 times. Bobby, 13, was hit 10 times. And Tommy, 12, was hit 3 times. The family's red dodge was found a half a mile away from the cabin, and a few partial fingerprints were lifted off the interior. Additionally, once the car was moved, a key was found under the car where the driver's side door had been. It was bagged and logged into evidence. On August 18th, Detective Callahan went to the Bulls' primary residence in Fountain Valley, the suburb of L.A. where the Bulls lived. The condo had been sealed by the Orange County Sheriff's Department to prevent anyone from entering. Detective Callahan found many important papers, such as marriage and birth certificates, plans for the cabin, and bank records. The couple's other car was in the garage. He also found documentation about Jim's recent work trip to Africa, including letters between the couple, indicating that there had been some marital strife between them. Detectives had a difficult time contacting the Bulls' as neighbors in Crestline, because most of them were only there on the weekends. There were a few permanent residents in the area, but almost no one had seen or heard anything out of the ordinary over the weekend. Except for the Ogles. Although what they saw was not suspicious or odd, they just ran into the Bulls on Saturday evening as the Ogles were out for their walk. The Ogles stopped to talk to Jim, then the rest of the family walked with the Ogles down the road for a few minutes, before turning around and going back home. The Ogles also said even if they had heard anything later that night, they would have thought it was from the party. According to the Ogles and other permanent residents, there had been a huge party on Saturday night on the street right below the Bulls' cabin. It was so noisy that no one could have heard gunshots over it. Another resident told investigators she had seen two cars at the Bulls' cabin on Saturday around 1.30. One was dark, and the other was a large, light-colored vehicle, possibly a station wagon. When this resident returned the next day, they did not see anything unusual. Other neighbors reported that Jim Bowles had borrowed a ladder from Herman Hintz, who lived through the week in Long Beach. When Herman heard of the murders, he called the Crestline substation and provided them with more information as to Jim Bowles' movements on Saturday. Herman had arrived at his cabin in Crestline around 10.30 on Friday night and immediately encountered a suspicious vehicle on the side of the road. It was a small, light-colored sports car, and there were two young males sitting on the front fender. Herman wrote down the license plate number and gave this information to investigators. He also explained he had seen Jim three different times on Saturday. Jim and the two boys had stopped to talk to him once they were on their way to the contractor's office about an issue in the kitchen. Then again later, Jim stopped to ask if he could borrow a ladder. He returned back to Herman's cabin around 3 o'clock to pick up the ladder. Herman also said he and his wife had driven by the Bulls' cabin on Sunday morning around 10 and saw the ladder, but did not see the Bulls' car. Investigators then began trying to interview the neighbors known as Weekenders. Raymond Gollin, like Herman Hintz, actually contacted the substation himself when he read about the murders. He had been staying in his friend's cabin over the weekend, which was down the hill from the Bulls's. Raymond said around 6 on Saturday he was cooking. He heard shots and looked outside. He saw a dark-skinned male around 30 years old with dark hair and possibly a mustache walking down the hill. He did not appear to be carrying a weapon. An airman from nearby Vanderburg Air Force Base, who had borrowed the cabin of friends for the weekend, was in the Crestline cabin from Thursday, August 12th through Sunday, August 15th. He had nothing to offer other than having heard a dog barking on Saturday but he was not sure of the time. 
The airman had taken a nap on Saturday, then gone out around 11 p.m., not returning to the cabin until around 2.30 Sunday morning. Because of his inability to tell investigators clearly about his actions on Saturday, the airman was one of the first people of interest in the case. The owner of the bar in Crestline told detectives she had talked to the airman and tried to introduce him to a young female, but the airman was disinterested. The owner also said the airman was fussy and had not made a pass at her like most patrons did. The airman took a polygraph test and passed it, so he was cleared. A waitress at the San Moritz Club in the Crestline area said the bulls had come in around 4 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. She said they sat outside on the patio and that after they finished eating, the boys went off to play. Jim received or made a phone call and rushed off. The waitress said she also noticed a former employee recently fired, sitting across from the restaurant and watching the patio for two hours. Several people reported that both Jim and Darlene had said they were retiring and moving to the Crestline Cottage permanently, although none of the family had heard about it. Investigators then interviewed the Bulls' colleagues at the Hughes Aircraft. One of his co-workers said Jim had made numerous maps to the cabin and given them out at work. The co-worker also said Jim had served on a jury recently and was distraught at the way the case had turned out. He also said Jim had a quick temper and would explode, but quickly get over it. The co-worker was asked about the Bulls' relationship, and he explained that there had been trouble when Jim went to South Africa because of some problems with his arrival. Because of this, Darlene had called Jim's supervisor several times upset. Investigators found out Darlene had been married previously, and rumor had it that her ex-husband had been in prison for 15 years. They also found out Darlene was very flirty, and while Jim was in South Africa, one family had invited her over to eat, but at the last minute she canceled because she had a date. A member of the Hughes bowling team, which Darlene was also on, said Darlene had told him before her death that her ex-husband had contacted her, wanting to borrow money. She told her bowling partner she did not have any money to loan because all of their funds were tied up in the cabin and their condo. Two people interviewed said Darlene had fears about going to the cabin, believing if they went to the cabin, they would never return. Darlene's bowling partner also admitted that he and Darlene were very close. He had gone out for beers three times over the summer, and their relationship had progressed to being sexual. After participating in a polygraph exam, he was cleared of the murders, but showed deception when asked if he was intimate with Darlene. Many of those interviewed said the dog was not friendly and could be vicious. One of their neighbors at the condo had watched Barbara chase another neighbor through the courtyard and back to his condo. Another neighbor who had lived by the bulls for years said they went to bed between 9 and 10 every night, so if they were fully dressed, they would have been killed before this time. They checked in on Jim's jury duty and could not find a connection, except for the brother of a convicted murderer who was a drug addict. Darlene's other brother, Clifford Rice, was also considered a person of interest. Because of the rumor, he had asked Darlene for money. There was no evidence to indicate he had committed the murder, so he was cleared. Her brother Floyd once made a comment to Jim's mother, Hester, that the dog had been killed first, and then Jim and Bobby. Floyd insisted he knew this information, but Hester just thought he was saying it for the inheritance. If Darlene was the last living, the Rices would inherit the money. I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsors. Medterra is one of the leading CBD brands in the industry with a full line of functional CBD products. All of their products are third-party tested for quality and purity, and they contain zero THC. They have a new topical pain cream that's great for an active lifestyle, or if you just hurt a little bit every day, like many of us, or are recovering from an injury. It applies easy and smooth and leaves you with a refreshing relief that you can take with you no matter where you go. They sent me some of this a few weeks ago, and I gave it to my grandmother, who has arthritis. She had been experiencing some periodic pain that she often gets, and especially in her hip area. So I grabbed the new pain cream, and I rubbed it all over her leg and even on her hands. 
and she said that it almost worked instantly and it lasted for a few hours. The product has allowed her to address her pain in a way that she hasn't been able to before without having to take any medication. I personally like the nice smell, how instant and cooling it feels. I've used it on my hands for my arthritis and really Medterra's dedication to quality. I've recommended it to people like my mom, my dad, and my brother who all deal with lingering pain or soreness. Visit MedterraCBD.com and enter code TCFC at checkout to receive 20% off. That's MedterraCBD.com and enter code TCFC at checkout to receive 20% off. Darlene's ex-husband was investigated as well. They had not been married very long and he was much older than her. He was 52 when she was only 17. He said once they were married and began sharing a residence together, she acted like a child. The marriage was annulled and there did not appear to be any ill will between the two. Of course, in an investigation of this type, the investigators received some rather interesting phone calls. Detective Callahan received information from a psychic that the man who had committed the murders had red hair and threw the weapon into a well northeast of the cabin. Another person called to give Detective Callahan astrological information about Jim and Darlene. Another caller reported that she had listened to a radio show about the murders, and the same person called three times and used the exact phrasing each time. Two separate individuals from Hughes Aircraft called to offer rewards for information, but the Hughes Aircraft name had to be kept out of it, and the terms were confusing. In the end, the money for the reward never materialized. About a week after the slings, investigators received information that Donald Edwards, employed by the California State Forestry Service, had admitted to co-workers that he had committed the murders. Detective Callahan and Sergeant Patterson drove to the ranger station where Donald worked and asked him about his confession. Donald agreed to talk to them and quickly told them he owned a twenty two rifle, which was at his home in San Bernardino. Donald was arrested and taken into custody after his rifle, gloves, and boots were found. Donald explained he was only joking, and after a night in jail, he was released. An elderly resident of Crestline called at the end of August and explained that just a few weeks prior to the murder, she had been at her cabin resting when the door opened and a man walked in. She got up and asked him what he wanted, and he fled. She was concerned because her dog had not barked, which was abnormal. When shown photos, she indicated the former cook from the San Moritz Club was the same man who had come inside her cabin. As the investigation progressed into September, investigators released photos of the Bulls family members and also of their car. Sergeant Patterson explained the posters and photos were released to hopefully jog someone's memory of seeing the 1962 Dodge Polaro four-door hardtop in the Crestline area on the weekend they were murdered. Sheriff Bland assigned nine different investigators to work on the case to try to find a suspect. Shell casings were sent to the FBI for testing, and it was determined from the firing pen, extractor, and ejector marks that the weapon was a pistol made by the High Standard Manufacturing Company, or the Hartford Arms and Equipment Company, which was purchased by High Standard in 1932. Investigators questioned a parolee, Frank Laughlin, from Washington State about the murders. He was also charged for being a felon with a gun and receiving stolen property. Although he was cleared in the murders, he was found guilty of several burglaries in the area and sentenced to 45 years in prison. His arrest cleared over 80 burglaries. In December 1965, Floyd requested that the cabin be cleaned. He asked the San Moritz Club to box up the Bulls' personal items. The family also wanted the bloody couch and bed removed. Once the items were ready, Floyd retrieved them and said he noticed some other items had not been boxed up. He put these in a box, loaded it in the car, and drove home. When he went through the boxes, he found several twenty-two shells in a small box. He contacted the sheriff's office who came and got them. The shells were actually quite old, and no one knew how they got into the cabin. Investigators could find no link between these shells and the ones used by the murderer. 
A year after the murders, investigators spoke with someone who said she had talked to the Bullses the year before, and Jim had told Darlene to hurry up because someone was coming to the house at 8 p.m. She thought it was someone named Joe. Another witness came forward to say they had been nearly run off the road by a red car, matching the car on the posters. They had not considered it important until they saw the posters a year later. In late 1967, investigators believed they had finally caught a break. George Robert Burt Stewart was arrested in Fort Worth, Texas, on suspicion of a double homicide in Mobile, Alabama. Burt had been in a mental institution previously, and between July 1965 and February 1966, he had been working at a church camp in Twin Peaks, just a few miles from the Bulls' cabin. He was 26 years old at the time of the murders, and people at the camp said he needed to be watched at all times. The reverend who ran the camp said Bert liked to take walks in the woods and liked to play with the kids in the camp. One man said he had to tell Bert to stay away from his kids. People said Bert had two pairs of shoes, one with rippled soles. When found, the soles were worn down, but investigators concluded that the passage of time had caused this. Further investigation revealed that camp had been canceled the weekend of August 13th through the 15th, 1965, and Bert would have had the weekend free. Additionally, no one was in the camp that weekend. Bert was charged with the murders of two young boys in Mobile, Alabama. After his arrest in Texas, investigators from California flew to Texas and interviewed him. While being questioned, Bert admitted to sexual assault on the two boys in Mobile, but denied any involvement with the Bulls' murders. A polygraph examination was conducted, and several areas of deception were found in Bert's answers, notably involving the key being thrown under the Bulls' car where it was found. Investigators concluded that Bert was their suspect, but had no evidence linking him to the slayings. Another mystery in this case is that even though the cabin had been locked for months after the massacre, Someone had entered the cabin on numerous occasions. It has been 55 years since these brutal murders, with no new leads and no arrests. No obituaries were found for any of the surviving family members, such as Darlene's brothers or the couple's mothers. Several sources were used for this episode, but the primary document was An Unsolved Mountain Murder Mystery by Robert Bonson, published January 28, 2004 in the Mountain News. If you have any information on these murders, please contact the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review and rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com slash TCFCPodcast, Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod, and of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, TCFCPod at gmail.com. This episode was written and researched by Susie St. John, with additional research done by Brittany Martinez, content editing by Brittany Martinez, Produced by the best in the business, Nico at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or We Talk of Dreams.com. <laughs>